Hello, everybody. Uh, I want to talk about the human story as it relates to our residency on this planet. And the thing I don't want to talk about is the past, but I want to talk about our future residency on this planet, hopefully into millennia. And in order to introduce my talk, I'd like us to first look at Bill Gates' TED Talk uh, 20, 2010 and his one wish. Together. So this is a wish. It's a very concrete wish that we invent this technology. If you gave me only one wish for the next 50 years, I can pick who's president, I can pick a vaccine, which is something I love, or I could pick that this thing that's half the cost with no CO2 gets invented. This is the wish I would pick. This is the one with the greatest impact. If we don't... I agree. I uh, uh, resonate with that wish. But the problem is the rest of his talk talks about a traveling wave reactor, which is a continuation of thermal nuclear reactors. And it's great, but there are some difficulties with doing that, even though he addresses a concern I'll get to in a moment. I think the broader issue is we're so dependent upon oil, and frankly, fuel independence, our problem is how to replace oil for transportation as the primary problem. So let's hear what uh, Yassi has to say from his TED, Chapman Yu, 2012. Modest. So the genie, he wasn't born then, so he started with gold. And he said, well, so what about the gold? I said, well, that's about $8 trillion. Not sure how large that is. So how about all the bank deposits in the world? Well, he figured out very quickly, I don't know how, that it's $14 trillion. And then I said, well, well there's a lot of companies. Maybe I can own all the companies in the world as well. And that came out to be $65 trillion. All right, now that sounds interesting. Then I thought, maybe I want to hold government debt. <laughs> uh, actually, I don't, but, <laughs> but then I asked, is this the most we can own? And the answer is no. There's one asset that is larger than all the other assets in the world combined and that is the value of the world oil reserve, $180 trillion. And that's a shock. That is a shock, and that is the issue. And the issue is how do we move beyond that? And since it's such a gigantic number, it's not only a gigantic number economically, but it's a gigantic number in the CO2 that can be exhausted in the atmosphere, and climate change is a real concern that we do need to deal with, and that addresses my story about what about human being into the next millennia. So, uh, what Yossi talks about is moving off of oil to other fuels, but biofuels then rob foodstuffs from the people of the world in order to be able to eat. And so if we're going to make the choice of powering our vehicles, about a billion of them, and do it at the expense of starving people to do it, that doesn't seem to me to be the way to address the concern, although he's on the road. So this is what Shia Gassi said. So, how would I run a whole country without oil? That's the question that sort of hit me at Davos afternoon four years ago. Let's see what he has to say about his idea. In, on a random visit to Tesla on some afternoon, I actually found out that the answer comes from separating between the car ownership and the battery ownership. In a sense, if you want to think about it, this is the classic batteries not included. Now, if you separate between the two, you could actually answer the need for a convenient car by creating a network, by creating a, a, a network before the cars show up, and the network has two components in them. First component is you charge the car whenever you stop. Ends up that cars are these strange beasts that drive for about two hours and park for about 22 hours. And so what we added is a second element to our network, which is a battery swap system. You drive, you take your depleted battery out, a full battery comes on, and you drive on. And you don't do it as a human being, you do it as a machine. It looks like a car wash, you come into your car wash, and the plate comes up, holds your battery, takes it out, puts it back in, and within two minutes you're back on the road, and you can go again. Okay, this is a great idea. But how are we going to power a billion cars in order to make a difference and move off the oil? In order to do that, we would have to have massive capability of generating electricity. And David Goodstein, in the movie A Crude Awakening in 2006, said global electricity generation is about 10 terawatts total. It's now 14 today and growing. If we were to convert all of it to current nuclear, it would last 10 to 20 years. And why is that? 
Well, let's see, we've got to catch up here. Next slide, please. That's the amount of uranium-235 that we're using to run our nuclear power plants. And if we were to replace everything, that's all we'd have to replace it. But this is the rest of the uranium isotopes we're not using. And of course, Bill addressed that in his TED talk, and I'm gonna address it here in a moment. This is thorium, three times as much or 560 times more than the uranium we're currently using. And we're not making utility of any of this, and it behooves me we should. It's important to do that, because how are we going to generate about 10, uh, I'm sorry, 100 terawatts of electricity to run the fleets of transportation that Shai's talking about? Under the current paradigm and using hydrocarbons, we can't do it. So it behooves me to look at this problem a different way. And the way I want to look at it is uh, this chart shows how we've been using energy resources. You know, this goes back to 1650 in the United States. But look at this explosion of the categories, natural gas, oil, coal, nuclears down here, wind and solar and hydroelectric. And uh, uh, it's so confusing to see it that way that it, it seems to me that looking at it as energy return on energy investment is more impactful. It gives now a narrative why it's important to address this concern and to see that thermal wood per, per, uh, operates at four to one, thermal coal 10 to, 10 to one, two and a half times more, 100 to one for oil, and then look at the fall off. That is 1973, the oil embargo, and since that point the easy oil has been extracted mostly, and we've been now transitioning to unconventionals, which is causing more of a problem for climate change. And so I want to address all of that. And if you look over here, this is the crisis that we see before us now. Nuclear, the current form of nuclear I told you about, and all of the renewables perform no better than wood way over here 200, 250 years ago. That's why we're seeing the conflicts we're seeing. That's why we're seeing the difficulties we're seeing globally. And I want to propose that we look at this problem in a new way. The American economy is running on empty. An apocalyptic decline in, the growth, uh, in growth for the US over the last 50 years uh, is coming. Now, Robert Gordon had just finished his TED Talk, 2013. And it's not posted yet, but it's going to be posted. And I have read his papers, and I have read uh, his uh, presentation at Davos this last January. And the reason he says this is because of the problem I identified in the previous chart. That problem shows that we really need to do something, and the question becomes, what do we do? So I'm thinking that if we're going to use nuclear energy in a completely different way, if we're going to, if we're going to convert all of the uh, uh, fertile elements that you saw in the previous chart and convert those and use them, then we need to think differently about how to generate electricity from them. And I think that looking at the Earth in a critical way could help us to get to that point. So to get to that way of looking, I want you to look at these two diagrams. And the point of these two diagrams is that you not understand them. The point is that you see that this, which is thermal convection, is so similar to density convection. This happens in seconds or fractions of seconds. This happens over millions of years. Two dissimilar materials, dense materials, they work against each other. And notice that they evolve in a very similar way. And I think that's important because now we want to look at how the entry of the Earth works. And so I have a little demonstration. Who's ever seen a tornado in a bottle? Has anyone ever seen that? Yeah. OK, some of you haven't, though. There's something happening in the interior of the Earth that is self-organization that's demonstrated by this bottle. And we're going to see some structures in the interior of the Earth that show how this works. Let me do it once more because it's cool. How does the molecules in the water know to do this? That's what you should be thinking. So if we look at the interior of the Earth, what we see in the interior of the Earth is very similar structures. This is a plume rising to the surface. If you notice, I had uh, the waters going down because of gravity. But in this view here, the heat of the core of the Earth is driving the materials up 
towards the surface. And then they're descending, this blue line here and these blue lines are descending curtains. And guess what? That can be mapped all the way around the Earth. Next slide, please. And if you look at this very carefully, how all of that is convecting, it looks so similar to what we saw at the beginning. That. So I am proposing it is the self-organization of the motions of the interior of the Earth that are causing the magnetic field of the Earth that we then could model or mimic to make generators in order to use nuclear materials to do that. But why would I pro propose such a crazy thing? Well, it turns out in 1956, uh, 1957, and published in 1958, Richard Feynman and Murray Gell-Mann published a paper where they elucidated what happens in the nuclear interactions, the very nuclear interactions that are happening in the interior of the Earth, and what they discovered is there's a packet of spontaneous magnetism, a little dipole, that's released in those interactions, and guess what? Those materials in the Earth are perfectly capable of being par paramagnetized by that, and it turns out that the nuclear fuel inside the Earth is providing at least 52% of the heat that's driving the motions that we saw. But it's doing something else at the same time. It's also providing magnetism. But paramagnetism is hopelessly jumbled. It's just completely random. But the motions in the Earth are not random. They're organized. And those little packets of magnetism are organized too, giving rise to the global magnetic effect. I am proposing that that is a good model for a new way of doing a nuclear core. This new way of doing a nuclear core would have three axes, and there's something in electro, uh, uh, electromechanics called uh, the Fleming right hand rule. So you can all do this. You just take your f index finger and point it up. You take your middle finger and point it to the right. And you have your thumb pointing towards you. And this now models 90 degrees, 90 degrees, 90 degrees, just like in this diagram that you see here. And then I'm proposing that there should be shells on each of the axes. Go ahead and hit the animation, like this, on each of the axes. And what I've done is I've made a construct that has six sets of shells. Why six? Because you need one for each of the axes, three axes, and then you need the opposite. So that when you get the shells moving past one another, opposite to one another, it simulates convection like we saw before. So this is a mechanical way of doing what the Earth is doing. And I'm proposing it might be a way for us to make a magnetic field around a core and then be able to harvest the electricity because this becomes the rotor that then induces electricity to harvest electricity, not steam, not the 19th century technology that we're trying to limp along with, but something new. Please hit the animation. So you can see how it reduces back down and how they nest together. And notice that the arrows are opposite to one another for all the hemispheres. And so it is my hope that if we could figure this out, we then could liberate vast amounts of electricity to realize Shia Ghassi's program. And Elon Musk, everyone knows about Tesla Motors, and we've already got the cars to do it, we just can't power them. It turns out that Airbus has already designed the 2050 airplane, all electric airplane, we just don't know how to power it. But if we could do something like this, it could be this big, or it could be as big as this room, and then we can begin to re-energize our energy grids and also think creatively about new applications into the future, providing for that story I started with, which is the human residency on Earth into the millennia ahead, and hopefully granting Bill Gates his one wish. Thank you very much for listening.